lot of you guys are going to laugh at the title and think it's a joke, but it actually has way more meaning than the name of a great exotic from the raid. Anarchy can be summed up to describe the encounters, the weapon of course, and what took place on day one. Because oh boy, it was a nightmare. Before we get into it, I'll quickly say the story of this video gets into Discord troubles, DDoSing, the encounters themselves, the loot, etc. Regardless of how small this raid is, this is one of my favorite raids because it does something different. It creates anarchy in the fact that it tries several new things for Destiny, and I gotta give it props for that one. Now I want to welcome you to Scourge of the Past, the raid that created absolute anarchy. My code is still free shipping worldwide for G-Subs. If you guys did want to try it, seriously hop on it, man. I cannot promote this product enough. It is so freaking good. Any order over $30 is free shipping worldwide. Guys, we did it. We hit 150,000 subs before November 10th. I am doing a giveaway for a Deluxe Beyond Light. It should be in the description of this video. It's only going to be going until the end of this week. So make sure you guys get on that. It'll end Friday, October 30th. So make sure you guys are on it and enjoy the video. Some footage in this video is from players around the community. Their links will be in the description of this video as well as the music too. I'll keep Black Armory as short as Black Armory was until this raid dropped. Black Armory came out on December 4th of 2018. And unlike the last three raid videos I've done, Black Armory actually had a special heavy and primary system, except Weapon 2.0, where you could rock two specials and two primaries if you wanted to. Black Armory also had a Well of Radiance, one of the best supers in the game. Basically, everything Forsaken had, this DLC had, because it was the first time Bungie did seasonal content for Destiny. Now, I know some of you guys are wondering, Evan, where's the last wish video? And I'm going to point you right to my wildest 24 hours in Destiny history, buddy. But seriously, Black Armory came with a lot of controversy because Bungie only had released one forge in the first week and the average player was severely underleveled for it. Within the sort of structure of Black Armory, mm. there are four different forges, okay, and they rotate weekly. It would have been really possible for Bungie to make the first forge available at 600 light and easily doable around that. So that people pay their money, they log in, they've got something new and exciting to do, something yeah. to grind, it's like, yeah, cool. Totally. Instead, what they've done is they've sort of tweaked it so that you can't do that for at least a few weeks. The reason why people were bummed out is because, yes, it was seasonal content, but at the same time, it wasn't a lot of content considering just the Volunder Forge was released. It only came with a few weapons. The heavy machine gun Hammerhead, one of the best weapons in the game, the auto rifle Ringing Nail, and the sword Striker Surehand. Even though there were three weapons and a quest to get a guaranteed drop, people didn't like it because yeah, it was hard and it wasn't just enough content to sustain them. The average person needed to level up, and they were mad about not being at level and having way too hard of a time with only one forge release. But nobody really cares about all that when the raid comes out on a Friday. The Black Armory Raid, Scourge of the Past, would release only a few days later at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on December 7th of 2018. Teams prepped as much as they could for the raid, and the recommended light was 650. For the teams that were prepping, Iron Banner and Gambit Bounty Stacking, as well as Ethereal Key Hoarding, made leveling a breeze in Black Armory. People managed to climb up to the 640s and beyond with, while not minimal effort, less than it would have taken in other DLCs. Day 1 raiders came into the raid very overleveled, and bear in mind that contest mode did not exist at this point in Destiny 2's lifetime. So, that power level actually mattered and made things vastly easier. However, the stakes of the raid were still there for a 24-hour emblem and a world's first physical title belt, which Last Wish was the first raid to introduce. Unfortunately, no matter how high their power level was, some of the best raiders in this race wouldn't be able to stay in the raid. But more on that a little bit later. How would Bungie deliver on a raid that followed after the high point that was Last Wish? How would the community react to a seasonal model raid? Well, let the anarchy begin.
All right. Here we go. All right, we're in the city. I'm going to jump down. Oh, Black, we got a thing. Rally. rally flag. Let's go. Welcome to Scourge of the Past on day one. About an hour before the raid begins, we need to talk about what the hell happened here. I wouldn't normally give any kind of story information on people that ruin someone else's time, but I think it's important to get the full story of what happened during Scourge. So here we go. Battle.net is where Destiny 2 used to be located. And why is that important? Well, Battle.net had just recently introduced a join code feature where you could have somebody's player tag and join on them. Now, some of my console friends who play Trials know this all too well, but if somebody joins your lobby, they have a chance to snag your IP. Many well-known raid community figures were not able to participate in this raid race because of dumbass DDoSers. Some of the people that you would consider staples of day one raid races are not going to be in this video. I don't want this fact to detract from the accomplishment of the team that won day one because that's not the case at all. Every single raid after this would have players who were raid racing, probably needing a VPN just for security. But like I said, this raid still has a ton of fun in it and there is still some really good stories to it. Now that was stage one of Anarchy and stage two of Anarchy is the actual raid itself. Meet the first encounter, Botsta Downtown. Oh, sparrows, sparrows, sparrows. Yeah. Reach, bolt, something. The enemy's by me. There's a little orb over here. We're on level. Alright, so we probably gotta split up. Hmm. I mean, there's yeah, gotta okay, be a so reason like... that we have sparrows. Looks like there's a ball or something you bring to the machine. This first encounter started in a city. It was where we always wanted to be in Vanilla Destiny 2 campaign. We always wanted to explore a city, and we finally got to do it in this raid. A little bit. The first thing that players would notice in this first encounter is that you have an insane amount of freedom, which is very unlike Destiny raids. The second thing you might notice is skyscrapers everywhere. The third? You can pull out your sparrow. It's exciting because it's the first time in a Destiny raid, to my knowledge outside of Vault of Glass, that you could Sparrow, and it was encouraged that you do. In fact, it's basically one of the main mechanics of Scourge. Players on day one would first have to figure out what the hell this Berserker enemy was and how to defeat it. It was pretty simple. Shoot the back and chest, break the shield, kill the yellow bar. The second portion was to figure out how to read the map. The orange ball meant Berserker with the charge, a certain number of green dots indicated places to deposit, and yellow dots indicated the player location. You would have somebody read the map while everybody else went and found the Berserker to kill, then picked up charges. The yellow dots that appeared above each player's head corresponded with the green ones that showed the correct place to dunk the charges. One, two, three, four, or five, which is map, have fun getting that on day one, because you guessed it, Discord went down. Level three of Anarchy. Teams had to set up alternate methods just to communicate, like TeamSpeak, game chat, and yeah, using the old classic phone in your pocket. Especially for people who were streaming. It was a pain in the ass, to say the very least. Like I said, Anarchy. Anyways, the goal was speed. That goal would carry out to the entire raid. If you didn't deposit charges into the correct places and didn't replace the map's faulty Duracell batteries, then you were kaboom. The thing about this encounter is that it all came down to where the charges dropped. And would you get lucky enough to get a charge that corresponded with where you were at? Sometimes you had to go back and forth a million times. By the way, whoever decided it was a good idea to power the whole city by battery? Seriously, like what the fuck? Anyone that picked up the charge would receive a two minute ionized debuff that you could not get rid of unless you killed yourself or died by natural causes like driving your sparrow right into a berserker or if you let the timer run out. Also, some fun, dumb stuff. There's an Easter egg that probably references Halo where you can get a tank by punching a box on the top of the skyscraper. And it gives you a triumph that's a pain in the ass to get, and you definitely don't ever have to do it, but I thought this was pretty fun. This took day one teams around 20 minutes to complete, and the takeaway was that a lot more freedom and nuance was given to players in encounters. 
you guys know that i love freedom and nuance and encounters so this one delivering on that hit very very nicely for me once you were done depositing four charges around the map it was time for the sparrow encounter we interrupt this program to bring you a maze in a raid once again something new in destiny 2. people could get lost in here for hours and everyone had a different path turn on the lights for your friends yell at them that they're going the wrong way fall into a pit and lastly wait 30 minutes for one lfg that didn't follow the leader nah this is where i, I mean, just came no, from no, yeah no, 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 no. that's where oh, i just came from dog, oh that's actually yeah, okay. I think they are. what is <laughs> okay buddy <laughs> Bro, I'm lost. On to encounter number two, and according to tier one's vendetta, the best part of the raid for him, Sparrow Racing League 2, Electric Boogaloo. Oh, this is so sick. This is condone. Well, one of us is dead already. Those oh. boxes are at the end too, and you have to do that to close them up. Oh, oh, open I sesame. Missed, I missed the gate. Bro! This one is fairly simple and straightforward, but one of the highlights of the raid. Sparrow Racing was sorely missed in Destiny 2, and everyone had been asking for a Sparrow encounter since the dawn of time. If you don't suck at driving, you were able to beat the giant, flaming, floating eyeball chasing after you in a race. You also had to touch a bunch of buttons to get a secret chest that gave you a chance at the best Sparrow in the game, fallen relevant mods, and allowed you to take a shortcut. It's short, it's sweet, and I love this one. Now for playing with tanks, the tank encounter. There's like, there's shocky under. Oh, there's a big servitor. Kill him. Yeah. Play the final boss, I want to say, maybe. No way. Final. I don't know the actual name, so that's what we're calling it. It is what it is. This encounter introduced an LFG nightmare. It really did. The first thing that you would notice is that there was a weird crumpled up mechanism in the middle. The second thing you would notice is that there's electric doors, and you had to shoot this giant servitor that was just sitting there. Once the servitor was dead, the encounter started and you had to send three people down below to grab the different buffs. Continuous buff, angular buff, and parallel buff. And then the fourth buff. See that ominous red buff that keeps changing shapes? So shiny, so worth it. Must get buff. No, don't actually hit this one because it causes a nuke to explode and every single fallen and guardian is dead. Holy shit, Bungie, why are we nuking all of Earth? After grabbing two of the same buff, make sure that you don't cross paths with another teammate. You needed people above to murder the next servitor up top. Then, you leave the way you came in and deposit the buffs into whichever depot thing you wanted to. One up top, two to the right, and three to the left. Now, it's time to just shred them with a tank. On day one, if they knew to do what we do now, this would have been much faster of a clear. Can you have two tanks up at once or no? no. Yes, yes, you just, yes, you can. You have to charge the uh, opposite circle. Though. Is there somewhere I need to slam specifically or not? Yes, you yes. can come back. Go, go, go to lethal, go to lethal. Okay. Can we shoot the tank or the thing in mid while right we use No, only, only the tank. This encounter is also absolute anarchy because, hey, if you live in a different country, hey, if you know how to time your missiles correctly, you can finish off this boss within seconds. Not joking. Now, here comes the final encounter of this raid. Meet Insurrection Prime. A squishy servitor in a rinky-dink mech with a bunch of guns, literally. Vendetta mentioned instead of pushing for a difficult raid experience, the raid design team at Bungie decided to push the boundaries of what they had done before. 
The final boss, while not overly impressive in terms of difficulty level, is literally a humongous and interactive mech. Beyond all that, he's cool as hell. His model is so cool that we're even getting him in Beyond Light as a regular enemy. And I gotta agree with Vendetta on this one. I think this boss is one of the cooler looking bosses in the game and super outside the box thinking. Tier 1 was at the final boss within an hour and 8 minutes, and this boss would take roughly 40 more minutes. If that doesn't say anything about the final boss, nothing else will. It was not too difficult for them. But I want you to remember that rally flags are in the game, unlike Leviathan raids, so your ammo economy isn't really an issue. These guys were also overleveled, and contests didn't exist. So keep that in perspective for the difficulty of this boss on day one. The mechanics were simple. A combination of the first and second encounters. Find the Berserker, identify the charges, deposit the charges in the correct spots to spawn the tanks. The person on the map acted as the guide for the two berserkers killing the charge runners. This time you didn't need to deposit a charge to the map at all except to start the encounter, which leads me to believe that Bungie had intended for a hard mode and didn't really get to it. The other three members acted as floaters. They were essentially secondary map readers if needed and had completely different duties. They killed snipers and stunned the boss's more powerful player focused attacks. Fallen snipers were no joke during day one either, and they could still knock you out if you weren't careful. So getting rid of them was extremely important. The boss also had six glowing white points that you would shoot several times to get rid of his shield before DPS. And if you didn't, you literally couldn't shoot him with the tank to start DPS. Finally, the boss had several focused attacks that damn well hurt if you didn't stun him out of them. Stunning the boss also gave the charge runners extra time to spawn the tanks if they were running slow. If everything went quick and smooth, it was easy to move on to the DPS cycle. Now, DPS incorporated the mechanic from the tank encounter. The boss would unleash a frequency that distributed three buffs evenly among the six players. If you were too close to a teammate that had a different buff than yours, you took damage from the tethering until your eventual death. We're tethered now, you're close. Get away from each other. Move the tank away. Oh, okay, whenever you see tethered, just run away from each other, I got it. Yeah, yeah, there's like little bit of markers on the map. I got killed by cross streams, someone killed me. Okay, I think being tethered decreases the amount of your damage. Does it? If you weren't close enough to the second player that shared your own buff, you missed out on a massive damage buff called Phase Synergy. Correctly pairing to receive Phase Synergy would make or break the DPS cycle. Anarchy ensues again. Nope. Are we about to die? No, no, shoot him. Yeah, keep shooting, keep shooting. Oh, buff your teammates. Tethered. Good. Yeah, dude. What? You're not. Wait, yeah, why'd you die? I don't know why I died, but I No, I know why you can't mix the auras. It's the same thing. If your teammate was in the wrong spot, everyone died. And I mean everyone. In the end, there was a few different strategies for pairing placements. One strategy is not objectively better than the other, and yet still the rivalry about these strats lives on in the raiding community to this day. It boils down to CAP versus ACP versus PAC versus CPA like the tax person versus PCA. All of them work, but only the real ones know that Pac is the best. He's a great guy. Anyway, as long as you were on point with timing and paired up correctly, you were golden. Damage wasn't a problem due to overleveling, but consistent communication and quick decision making was absolutely imperative. Remember, this raid was focused more about speed than damage cutoffs. Beat this boss, and the anarchy that was this raid becomes yours to wield. Now, it was time for Insurrection Prime to meet his fate. Yes. Not North Guys, one, of one of you is already there. One of you is already there. North. <laughs> focus up, focus up. I'm trying not to die. Should be an right, easy one more, finish. Dude. Yeah, one more. Let's do it. One more. Kill the, kill the ads first. We got it, we got it. Just finish him off. Once it says tether, just run away. Maybe get my res. Oh my god, these ads are freaking making me miss every shot right now. No! Oh, are you two? Uh, res me, res me. One more, one more. <gasps> ah! Get, get Dude, positions I... for shield. Not every position. DJ. Perfect. Good. 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 Freaking job. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Might be something else. Might be something else. Yeah. yeah. I'm done. Yep. The servitor, watch out for the. Maybe. Watch the servitor. I think the I think the floor is gonna open underneath them. Go. Careful, 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 careful. 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 This is totally Indiana Jones, man. Oh, this is the chest we saw earlier. Yeah, it's the window. I got a.
tier one won the world's first race with a time of one hour 47 minutes and 41 seconds 20 minutes before every other team tier one has always always been competing for world's first and they finally got theirs they'd completed top five for almost every single other raid race finally and deservedly they came in first The question you're probably asking yourself is, well, <laughs> anything with Destiny Raids, was the loot worth it in this raid? And yeah, yeah it was, baby. This raid was the second raid after Last Wish to introduce curated legendary rolls from the chess. The shotgun threat level from the first encounter came with Trench Barrel, and this was insanely powerful at the time because auto-reloading was a thing and Trench Barrel was very, very strong. The Arc Fusion Rifle could come with Backup Plan, which was basically Plan C, so yeah, that's gonna be good in PvP. Finally, there was an unimpressive rocket launcher because, you know, rockets are just... Hey, can we get a rocket buff, please? And an Arc Scout Rifle, which is only good if you had Box Breathing, so basically... Can we get a scout rifle buff, please? As for the raid gear, it was black and red and kind of ugly, but like there was some good stuff. Hey, Titans, you had a penis helmet. Huh? Hey, Titans, hey, penis helmet? Hmm? But the chest for doing the sparrow race was the only place in the game to get fallen mods, period. Some of these mods are ridiculous, man. And you know, we know now that Bungie's retiring all these mods, but don't forget at least that these mods are good still in this raid. And you can get the Sparrow always on time, which is the best Sparrow in the game because it's like the only Sparrow with perks outside of Speed Demon and has a perk that makes it so enemies are less aggressive to you. Please, more Sparrow perks, Bungie, please. And of course, don't forget the final piece of anarchy from this raid, one of, if not the best exotic in the game. I mean, hell, I even have an emote of it on Twitch. Anarchy. A grenade launcher that shoots spiderweb traps of arc energy wherever the hell you want it to. It's really unique because it does passive damage, so you can swap to another weapon while the traps are active. And I should probably mention as just a tip for anybody that uses Anarchy, only two really matter unless it's Argos then you can shoot three at the bottom and two up top but I see people shoot like six at a time just 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 do two man this weapon had a chance to drop from the final boss chest and for those on day one they knew they got worlds first because this exotic dropped for all six of them that was another reward for world's first team hard mode yeah there is no hard mode they got rid of hard mode after spire of stars because prestige wasn't doing enough People weren't playing it, and nobody really liked locked loadouts, and rewards weren't that sick for prestige mode. I think the community can agree that we would like hard mode back with new loot tied to beating it. A man can pray. Bungie, please bring it back someday. So that is Scourge of the Past. There's not really much else to talk about. I mean, some people did some low man challenges here. There's some cool speed runs if you want to watch those. And there's some funny stuff that happens with this boss. But yeah, that's uh, that that's about it. It's farmable for the mods if you need the mods or anarchy. You can farm it for that. I think this raid story could have been a lot cooler had some anarchy not ensued and ruined it early. But for what it is... I think that the anarchy this raid brought to Destiny's raid arsenal created a lot to love. This raid is super unique from the rest of the raids in the game, and characteristically it stands out pretty dang strong. It's a nice quick raid that can definitely get people into raiding, just don't hit the big red buff and tank encounter no matter how shiny it is, and you're good to go. One thing I hope people don't take away from this raid is that you only farm end boss for anarchy. 
I hope that you can appreciate this raid for its other qualities. I know that I enjoy playing it with friends and for what it is as a whole. Realize that this raid day one is the reason that every other raid after it will have a contest mode turned on for day one, and it would change what it meant to participate in a day one from then on. I would like to thank everybody for watching. So if you guys did enjoy this video, a like would be greatly appreciated as well as a subscription. Seriously, thank you. And that's it, guys. Have a wonderful rest of your day and enjoy the bloopers. Hmm. Oh. That worked. That did work. Oh, a hole! Ranger dead. What? It's three symbols, or it's three.